Macedonia lies in Europe's Balkan Peninsula. Part is the independent Republic of Macedonia, where the upcoming program was made. Other parts are in Greece, Bulgaria, and Albania. It's been a crossroads of peoples, a border for empires, a confluence of Islam and Christianity. Its history has been brutal yet generous. It's filled with antiquities and monuments and renowned for traditional attire and musical folklore. Today's Macedonians savor their 6,000-year history and heritage. Here's a glimpse of their spiritual and cultural riches made possible by a grant from the Macedonian Arts Council. It's been like this for centuries in Macedonia. Ever since St. Paul sought to spread the word of God to the people here in 52 and 53 AD. The Holy Bible is saying that Macedonia really exists. The Holy Bible say to us that St. Pavle come here in Macedonia and uh, baptize the people from here. Macedonians settled here at the end of the second millennium before Christ and according to legend took their name from their mythical ancestor Macedon. Macedonians they were then, Macedonians they are today as their art and artifacts attest. A face from their history stares back at us across time. It is the golden mask of antiquity. While Philip of Macedon and his son Alexander the Great were securing faraway lands. Macedonian artisans were forging treasures such as this mask in the old city of Ohrid, Macedonia's pearl jewel on the shore of Lake Ohrid. The mask was returned to the light of day in 2002 by archaeologist Pasco Kusman, who led the team that unearthed the mask and a golden glove with a gold ring from an ancient burial site near the city. I love you, my Kuzman says that funerals speak about the religious traditions that were very characteristic of Macedonians from this area. The mask tells us, he says, that the distinct Macedonian culture has been here since antiquity. This area is a part of ancient Macedonia, he says, and life from the ancient Macedonian tradition was functioning in the 6th or 5th century BC. This mask was the fifth such discovery, but this one is the only one that remains within the borders of today's Republic of Macedonia. The previous four can be seen in museums of neighboring countries where they were taken by foreign archaeologists who excavated many treasures of antiquity in Macedonia. This one probably adorned the face of a princess upon her death and lay undisturbed for nearly 2,500 years. Most historians agree that the ancient Macedonians lived to the north of Olympus and the ancient Greeks to the south of the fabled mountain. The ancient Greeks considered themselves cosmopolitan and sophisticated and were enamored with the visual and oratory arts. They so disliked their northern neighbors they referred to them as barbarians. When they demanded that the Macedonian athletes produce a Greek pedigree in order to be included in the ancient Olympics, the Macedonians staged their own games. One of their rulers, Archelaus, founded their own Olympic games in the holy city of Dion, where Macedonians could compete in chariot races and many athletic disciplines. In Roman times, boxing and wrestling were added to the games. Macedonians continue to excel in these disciplines, even in the modern Olympic Games. As the conquest of Alexander attests, the Macedonians were, before all, warriors. But they also built cities in faraway lands, Alexandria in Egypt, Bucephalia in India, and here in northwestern Macedonia, Heraclea, which Philip built as a strategic center of the Kingdom of Macedon. While Macedonia was powerful, Heraclea served as an important military and trading center. For this reason, the Romans sought to conquer it and did so in 168 BC. The city's Roman legacy is embodied in two symbols. One is the statue of Titus Flavius Orestus, who ruled the Roman Empire from about the third century AD. The other is the large amphitheater. Construction on it was likely begun during the reign of Hadrian. It holds seats for about 3,000 people. The arena 
is best remembered for the tortures of early Christians who were thrown to starving lions, suffering martyrdom for their faith. The Romans couldn't suppress the faith of the martyrs in Heraclea, and neither could the Huns, nor the Avars, or the Ostrogoths who followed and leveled the old Roman cities. Even though they destroyed the houses of worship, they couldn't erase the religion and traditions practiced by the people who had remained faithful to Christianity. When the pagans were gone, the artists and artisans of Heraclea infused a new vigor and style into the region, using Christian symbols as their models, such as a fruited grapevine with 12 grapes symbolizing the 12 apostles. In the early 5th century, the Byzantine emperor, Justinian, who ruled the Eastern Roman Empire from his seat in Skupi, near today's Macedonian capital, Skopje, encouraged the development of Christianity and Christian art here. The Christian subjects of Justinian's empire began building their own holy places on top of the ruins of the Roman foundations. It was during his rule that these mosaics were completed, the most wonderful and mysterious relics of that age still preserved here today. Buried under a protective layer of gravel at times, they reveal an art of antiquity that tells the story of Christianity in Roman times. Some of these mosaics are said to be the first representations of Jesus Christ. Others are said to represent the fruits of paradise. Still others signify the triumph of life over death, a particularly important message at the scene of the deaths of so many martyrs. The mosaic's composition reflects the early Christian view of the spiritual universe of four independent realms the heavenly kingdom, paradise, earth, and water. Unfortunately, only a fraction of these mosaics remain today. Most of this ancient artistry has been lost to age, weather, and the devastation brought by the Slav invasion of Macedonia in the late 5th century. The early 7th century saw the beginning of the ethnogenesis of today's Macedonians by the mixing of the ancient people with the Slavic tribes that settled on the Balkan Peninsula. In less than two centuries, the Slavs accepted Christianity, and the faith would be propelled further by two of their own, the Slav brothers, Cyril and Methodius, who created the first Slavic alphabet, known as the Glagolitsa, or the Glagolitic, later named Kirillitsa, the Cyrillic, in honor of the saint who first wrote it. Christianity, which up to then was taught in Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, was now promoted in a fourth language, the old church Slavonic language of the two Slav brothers from Macedonia. By encoding the language spoken by their parents, they created the first and everlasting language for the Slavs. You see the birth of, of, an, of a civilization. Uh, every civilization has to have a language and, a, and an alphabet uh, to write on that language. So you see Macedonia, many people say Macedonia is a cross, crossroad but with this example, with the, the two of the brothers, Kirill and Methodius, we see Macedonia as, as a place where culture originates. We see something very new, something that adds to the uh, beautiful mosaic of uh, civilization, human civilization. In 856, Emperor Michael III of Byzantium dispatched Cyril and Methodius to bring Christianity to the Slavs in Russia and later in Moravia, where they introduced the new alphabet to the local people there and translated the entire Bible into the old church Slavonic. Most of Eastern Europe speaks Slavic languages, Russia, and it's a, it's a huge part of the world. Um, and what we now today as a Cyrillic or a Russian script is something that originates from Macedonia. From the 9th century AD, this, you, you could hear a sermon in Slavic language and you, you could read the Bible in Slavic, which is a great accomplishment. Cyril and Methodius, now saints, not only codified the spoken Slav language, but brought it all the way to Rome. There with the blessings of Pope Adrian II, they conducted for the first time ever the liturgy in the old church Slavonic. The acts of these two monks are commemorated in an 11th century fresco at St. George's Church in the village of Corbinovo in southwestern Macedonia. Here we see Cyril's brother, St. Methodius, with the scripture in his new language in his hands. Renowned for its simple exterior, St. George's houses a very articulate interior. Inside, an angel spreads its wings across a wall from the year 1191. The angel Gabriel announcing to Mary that she is the mother of Christ, the Annunciation. 
This fresco so embodies the heritage of Macedonia that they have it on their currency. The Slav dominance culminated in the establishment of the Macedonian medieval state of Tsar Samuel. His reign, as was with Alexander the Great, was brief but stellar. He united all the Balkan lands under his rule and fought with Byzantine emperors for regional dominance until his defeat in 1018. During his time, Christianity flourished. The Ord Archbishopric, the official spiritual center of the Macedonian people, was founded here and would last until 1767 when the Ottoman Turks abolished it. In the 19th century, Bishop Theodosius of Skopje led a movement to re-establish an independent Macedonian Orthodox Church by restoring the Orhid Archbishopric. It was reinstated only in 1967 in a Macedonian Republic which by then was part of the Yugoslav state. But 10 centuries before, during the reign of Tsar Samuel, new layers of Macedonian culture were built on top of the old culture inherited from Justinian's empire. Here we see how today, yesterday, and antiquity reside in one place. It was beneath Samuel's fortress that Kuzman and his colleagues found the Golden Mask. It was beneath Samuel's fortress that archaeologists found a Roman amphitheater, more proof that a grand civilization was thriving here long before his time. And it is in the shadow of Samuel's fortress that modern Macedonians today continue to build another layer of culture some ten centuries after Samuel's time. It was during Samuel's reign that the Renaissance of the Middle Ages came alive in the Western world and its birthplace was here in Macedonia. Artists smoothed church walls to prepare the surface for the paintings that we see today. They chose as their media the fresco and the icon. Their subjects were Christian figures. Jesus at the cross, his mother Mary with him. The angels who served as messengers. The saints who had helped keep the religion alive during the tortuous periods of Roman enslavement and barbaric ruin. These frescoes represent some of the most important works of Byzantine art from the 12th century. They're on the walls of a monastic church near Skopje, the capital. The church is dedicated to St. Pontelemon. Built in 1164 out of brick and stone by a wealthy patron, it's the smallest preserved church of the five-domed Byzantine style. After it was built, it housed the monks who used it as a monastery in honor of St. Pontelemon, who died a martyr's death. Each fresco tells a story in the life of Christ and the saints. One scene tells us about the birth of Mary, the mother of God. In this scene, she's being washed in a basin by a woman dressed in a plain white scarf. Her own mother, Anne, is sitting upright in bed accompanied by a younger woman who is attending to her. It's a unique fresco representing the humanness of Mary and her own mother. Another fresco recalls the death of Christ on the cross, attended by his mother, Joseph of Arimathea, St. John, and other mourners. One is in the act of removing the nails from Christ's feet. Here his mother Mary is on the ground crying, holding his lifeless body between her knees. The image reveals St. John holding Christ's hand and at his feet Joseph of Arimathea and a companion join the mourners. Macedonian artists portrayed Christ and the saints as human, with real emotions and expressions, thus preparing the way for the great works of the Italian Renaissance. Renaissance have started here in Ohrid, in the church of St. Sophia. Before those frescoes have been discovered in St. Sophia, it was uh, considered that the Italian masters, the Renaissance masters in Italy, started presenting Christ and the Virgin as common people, as usual everyday people. But after the uh, frescoes in St. Sophia were discovered and cleaned up, they have seen that someone has started with such presentation, presentations of Christ and the Virgin much before, much earlier than the Renaissance started in Italy. Other frescoes at St. Pontelemon depict the hymnographer saints of the church, all holding the native language texts of their hymns. The layout of these life-size frescoes is the earliest preserved example of the saints of the Macedonian Orthodox Church. The stories the frescoes tell are the history of the church in the past, but they're also the living history of the church today. Here, even without a priest present, people come to take part in a continuity of faith that connects them to the people of the frescoes. The icons and frescoes take center stage on Good Friday in the most solemn occasion on the Orthodox calendar. 
And while the church walls and ceiling served as canvases for the artist's brush, the screen between the Orthodox altars and the faithful became panels for woodcarvers' icons and their carvings. Simply the word icon is Greek word, and the word itself means simply a picture or an image especially an image of a saint or some event from his life or some event from the church history, the Christian history. And uh, uh, typically for icon is that icon is always painted on wood. The technique of icon painting is very specific and speaks for itself. Icon are, icons are always painted on wood, especially walnut wood, because the walnut is a uh, a very resistant kind of wood, especially against humidity, against worms. And that's why we have preserved so many icons from, for example, 11th, 12th century. Against the backdrop of frescoes, the icons at St. Clement's Church in Ohrid add another layer to the story of the art of the Christian faith in Macedonia. Everything in an icon has its own meaning, artistic, essential, sacred, the type of wood, the size of the plank, the essence of the foundation and the lacquer, the paint, the expression, everything is in its place. And almost as if the creation of icons begins with light, like the world itself, the forms in the icons are produced in a golden setting. The portraits of Christ, his mother, John the Baptist, and the patron of this church, St. Petka Periskeva, reveal the role they serve on the iconostasis. There are some, uh, several tiers of icons that stand on the altar screen or the iconostasis. The first one, where the, the royal doors are in the middle, is called the despotic tier of icons, where large icons stand. The next tier of icons uh, shows uh, the great feasts of the Orthodox Church, usually 12. This rule was set uh, much before the church was separated. In the times when the church was one and only, before the great schism that happened in 1054. Their placement must adhere to strict rules about the order in which icons appear. It is this issue of the right way and the disagreement over the absolute power of the Pope that mark the beginning of the split of the Roman Catholic Church and the emergence of the Orthodox Church. At St. Clement's Church, historians have preserved some of the most precious icons that have been traced to the 11th century churches in Macedonia. It was here that the disciples of St. Cyril and Methodius, the Orhid born St. Clement and St. Nam, established an outpost of Orthodoxy and founded a literary school, the first ever Slavic university in the Balkans for the missionaries who then went further into Europe, carrying the icons of their faith and seeking the spiritual conquest of the people, true to the teaching of their patron, St. Clement. What interest would a man have to conquer the world if in the process of doing so he loses his soul? St. Clement of Ohrid wrote, bringing spirituality to the people of Ohrid. Today, 800 years later, spirituality breathes out of every corner of this city that is the cradle of the history, tradition, and works of iconic art. Macedonians have revered icons for their spiritual and artistic values. They're not only works of art, but a testimony to a voiceless ancient wisdom that speaks of the inseparability of body and the esoteric value of the soul. From the 14th century, the icon of the Mother of God. Here she is with the child. There's an icon bearing the date of the year 1262, an image of Jesus with a golden halo bearing a holy script. From the 12th century, a double image of the angel Gabriel and Mary at the Annunciation that she was to be the mother of Jesus. It's at the monastery of St. John Bigorsky in central Macedonia that the icons and iconostasis of yesterday meet the people of today in a spectacular setting. Here, a floor-to-ceiling iconostasis tells the story of St. John the Baptist, or St. John the Forerunner, as he's named in the Orthodox faith. It's said to be the most beautiful iconostasis in all of Macedonia. The original monastery here was dedicated in the year 1020, on a site where, according to legend, the icon of St. John actually appeared. After its destruction by the Ottomans, the monastery and its iconostasis were recreated between 1825 and 1829 by builders and woodcarvers from the region, some of whom left their self-portraits in the wood. There are more than 500 human figures on the panel. 
A relic of St. John the Baptist is reportedly kept here in this silver and gold chest that reflects the care and attention given to works of art and was created in 1835. The violent history of this contested land has not spared even the saints, their bodies often taken away, spoils of war for outside invaders. The relics of St. Clement are kept in the newly rebuilt St. Clement's Church, which rests on the very foundations of the one he built and designated as his final resting place back in the 11th century. But here in Pleoshnik lie only the partial relics of the saint. His head and torso were taken by the neighboring states, which now hold on to those Macedonian treasures. Such is the case with the golden masks and priceless icons and frescoes removed from Macedonian soil. Much has been taken, but much remains. And as archaeologists of today have uncovered more physical treasures of the past, Macedonians are reaffirming their social and cultural traditions by participating in many of their ancient customs. It's been like this for centuries in Macedonia. An ancient wedding ceremony is kept alive in the mountainous village of Galichnik, where each year on Petrovden Day, the holy day of St. Peter, young couples take their vows in a traditional wedding ceremony. This has been going on since the end of the 14th century, when Macedonia fell under Turkish rule and for the next 500 years under Ottoman rule. The spirituality of the people, the traditions and customs were kept alive, no matter the time, no matter the conqueror. Because Ohrit was one of the most developed artistic and cultural centers in the past. So there must be a lot of artists, artistic workshops, that worked in this town and produced a lot of icons. Not not just for the churches in Ohrid, but for a lot of purchasers all around the area. For example, in the uh, 19th century, the greatest Macedonian icon painter, Dicho, who came from Western Macedonia, from the village of Tresonce, near Debar, spent a lot of time working here in Ohrid, and he has painted a lot of icons for Ohrid. Several years ago, I had an exhibition dedicated to his works that he made for Ohrid, and I counted about uh, 100 icons that he had made for Ohrid, for the churches and private purchasers in Ohrid. And he worked a lot. He painted uh, about uh, 1,500 icons during his short life of just 53 years. In Ohrid today, the descendants and apprentices of icon masters continue to create works of art from raw wood. In the shops of woodworkers, today's carvers are living the revival of their craft in Macedonia. You must have all spirits in this work. You must uh, know and you must uh, love this history of traditional making with wood. In Skopje, that same sense of reverence for the culture can be found in the shops along the streets of the old bazaar where a master silversmith plies his trade. At different times, this place was the creative center for over 21 different crafts, the most popular among them the filigree artists. This one works in silver, he says, because with silver he can achieve more artistic uses than with other metals. And the silver is important to be arts and that you to, to give from the, your heart and the, your mind what you think in your mind to put. And the, uh, always I see in the, when I walk in the nature, nature, clear nature. nature, yes, I walk and I, I, I look at the flowers, yes. <laughs> so your silver is flowers? Yeah, silver is flowers and uh, I, I think is this profession is king for the arts, for all arts. I, I, don't, I don't want to say another is not arts, yes, all is arts. But the king is this filigrane handmade arts. I think this is my area. Macedonian artists, whether woodcarvers, sculptors or craftsmen or painters, see their work come to life on the streets of their capital city and no few of them. here. An artist sells his art on the street, but most of Macedonia's 1,040 graduates of the Arts College of St. Cyril and Methodius University exhibit in galleries at home and around the world. There are 200 painters working actively in Macedonia today whose works come alive in the interior of historical monuments or archaeological sites that become temporary galleries. Silent witnesses to a historical period, the old iconic arts and the modern paintings complement and often complete the story of Macedonia. We can find them exhibited on the walls of a mosque. There are 125 of them in Macedonia. Or in a church or monastery. There are 900 of them in a country the size of Vermont. We often find them in open air exhibits on the grounds of antiquity sites. There are about 4,300 of them throughout Macedonia. 
and here at the National Gallery in Skopje. The spirit of the early days of Macedonian art remains through a thousand years, nurtured at the foot of Samuel's fortress, present in the early awakenings of the Renaissance, and carried on through a wealth of contemporary imagery today. In the words of Pasco Kuzman, this land and its name have endured over 2,800 years and will last another 5,000. The one thing we hope will change is that people will begin to see us in the larger context of our contributions to the world's great civilizations. Colors of Macedonia was made possible by grants from the Macedonian Arts Council, the Dominic Foundation, and generous donations by George Atanasiski, Michael Alexander, and Mike Zafirovsky. The mission of the Macedonian Arts Council is to promote and uphold the rich cultural traditions, arts, language, and literature of this European nation whose diverse cultural threads have long been interwoven in the ethnic tapestry of the United States of America.